That's a piece called Summer Substructures, and this year the Dublin Electronic Arts Festival pulled off something of a coup with the news that Coil would headline its 2004 festival, having pushed electronic experimentation to its outer limits. For over 20 years, the group gave their first ever Irish performance in Dublin's City Hall on Saturday night next, a very, very interesting venue as well for such an interesting group. Coil are John Balance and Peter Christofferson, and uh, they join me now from studio in Bristol. Guys, you're very, very welcome indeed. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Thank you. Just tell me a little bit about how you actually put your music together, because you are using sources from all over the place. Found uh, sources, musical instruments, electronic instruments, computers, you name it. Give me an idea how, how for example, that piece that we've just heard, Summer Substructures, how you'd actually go about putting it together. That, that one... Uh, uh, it was a good choice actually because it's similar to the way we'll be doing the concert on Saturday uh, it's improvised uh, Bill Breeze, the viola player on that uh, came over and he, he basically played as the tune and I, I sang along uh, I think actually while he did it but then, then again sort of overdubs uh, but all the lyrics came straight out of the top of my head they weren't written down they were just resp a response an emotional response to the music as I heard it What's what's great for us is that uh, computer technology has reached the stage where you can react spontaneously to things. In 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 the past, it's always been very much of um, a kind of uh, piecing together of, of jigsaw pieces that were pre pre arranged or preset. But now, um, the tools, uh, especially for the Macintosh, have come along so so far that y y the person doing the manipulation can you know can be a third or whatever a third mind in mm -hmm. the process and actually do things freshly and spontaneously so you get that feeling of you know not being tied to a specific beat or a specific tempo or any of that nothing like the good old apple mac but um <laughs> in terms of the performance then when you when you do if you do summer substructures in dublin on saturday will you improvise it again or will you play to the same pattern as is on that record and that recording of it uh we would be doing it again we'd be revisiting but with different uh, aspects and nuances and for example in in this case the the role of the sort of traditional musician if you like is is being played by cliff stapleton who plays the hurdy-gurdy uh, rather than by with a viola so so what we try to do as much as possible is to get the feeling of of kind of familiarity of of you know sounds that that have a long tradition uh you know going back through hundreds of years but at the same time to address you know the the feelings and the issues that are important for us now and you also do some very interesting takes on either very very familiar pieces of music or um, pieces from other groups. I want to finish later for totally parochial reasons with uh, your collaboration with, with Gavin Friday on yeah. a cover yeah. version of a Virgin Prune song. But I'm particularly interested in the your version of, 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 of Tainted Love. Just tell me how that came about, yeah. the Soft Cell song, um, uh, and uh, maybe talk a little bit about the Mark Armand video. Yeah, uh, when I moved up to London uh, in the early 80s, I I just became friends with Mark through the clubs and then it turned out that he, he knew Psychic Television and then I joined Psychic Television and met Psychic Peter. Television was an, an offshoot of, of, of Throbbing Gristle which was the kind it of... It was the band that was uh, the band or organization that was formed after Throbbing Gristle, mm. uh, the demise of Throbbing Gristle, yes. And I, I, I was, uh, you know, I was sort of running around a uh, young buck around London with, with Mark and a few others and uh, Tainted Love became the, the, the huge hit it was and, and you know, it became the sort of thing that nobody dare touch. It was the, it was the holy grail. Yeah, or the the, <laughs> the golden goose. <laughs> so we had to do we had to do something, you know, against the grain that we thought everybody would, you know, would throw their hands up in horror. But it, it also came, you know, in, unfortunately, you know, with the HIV and AIDS epidemic starting up in America, and we had a few friends who that you know it touched us personally in that sense, and we did it as a morality sort of uh, or a wake-up call basically 
And uh, of course, Mark Almond is is, uh, uh, is 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 ill at the moment. He had uh, he, he had is an accident very yeah. recently. So I mean, if yeah. you if you did decide to play it, there would be a, cer- a certain resonance there. But yeah. uh, the 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 video that you did, which starred Mark Almond, was was banned, but it has since found its way into the New York Museum of Modern Art collection. Very soon after it's, uh, after being banned, actually, it was it was bought by MoMA. Yes. Tell me about the tell me about the video and why it was banned. He plays some sort of an avenging angel, doesn't he? <laughs> Sort of. I mean, he comes in with a bunch of grapes and sort of lasciviously eats one of them, while somebody you know, appears to be lying dead, you know, dying in a bed. But uh, it was it was more. I don't know how we our take on these things is, is sort of. Why, why was it banned? Why was it controversial? It was played in uh, in you know clubs in America, all over America. Some chain of, of video people played it in, in the clubs, and the the club goers obviously didn't like. To be confronted with what you know what they were actually doing and be- the way they were behaving in the clubs, no one had, you know, very few people really had said that if you do this, this might happen. Uh, and we were, the, you know, one of the earlier people to say that sort of thing. So it was a cautionary. In- Sorry, I was going to say at two o'clock in the morning, you know, consequences of that kind are not really very palatable. Hmm. So we uh, <coughs> we were a bit uh, forward for that respect. But as I say, it has found its way into the into the, the MoMA collection. Let's actually hear a little bit of your take, of Coyle's take on mm-hmm. Soft Cell's Tainted Love. Once I ran to you, now I run from you. This tainted love you. I give you all a boy could give you. Take my tears, and that's not nearly all. Tainted love. Tainted love. mentioned uh, Throbbing Gristle a few minutes ago. Just um, bring me back. To talk to me a little bit about the lineage of Coil, the kind of uh, line of succession, if you like, between Throbbing Gristle, Psychic TV, and uh, and, and Coil, and how the, how it all came about. Throbbing Gristle was was a band that was started by myself and uh, Genesis Peorage, uh, Chris and Cozy, back in many years ago, in uh, 1975 or six, and at, at that time. It was just directly before punk, and we felt that um, the the music that was around had was not reflecting anything that we wanted to were interested in the slightest. And this was in the mid 70s, so we started this thing that became the kind of beginning of industrial, so-called industrial genre of music. And John was a uh, was at school at the time, and and occasionally would bunk off school to come to Throbbing Gristle performances, uh, and that's when he and I met and. Uh, it became clear that we were uh, destined to make uh, sparks of some kind together, and so we did for a while. And uh, it, Coil, as such, was was actually John's idea in the first place, and he w- it was his band. 
Uh, and continues to be his band. <laughs> so you're just a, kind of a guest, Peter, yeah? <laughs> I'm just uh, one of those uh, Long tenant, guess, tenants who you can't evict for, for, for sort of bureaucratic reasons. And where did the nickname Sleazy come from, Peter? I think Jen and Cozy uh, came from that. I, I, I wouldn't like to comment on what particular part of my personality caused that uh, <laughs> Epithet, but um, I, I, I do still, people still call me that to this day, so there must be something that I'm missing here. He's wearing a t shirt at the moment that says it ain't easy being sleazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it ain't. I'm sure it ain't. <laughs> and you, I, I mean, uh, aside altogether from the sound, from the electronic, the ambient, uh, the ambient sounds you create, you're also fascinated by the visual arts. And I think there's a there's a huge visual element to your performances, isn't there? We always, when we start to do a piece of music, we always say, you know, what what is the film that this is the music from? What what are the pictures that, you know, mm. that inspire the even music? if they're only in your head. Exactly, mm -hmm. and yeah. and uh, what we hope when we make a piece of music is that it will transport people from away from the the confines of the car or the the sitting room or the the um, concert hall into another place or another time. The music that we do always tries to transport people away from the present reality, um, and obviously visuals are, are as much a part of that as sound. You know that every every kind of of stimulus uh, that that humans feel can be used to bring them into the present or take them away from the present if it was possible to you know to have people physically feel the things that we were feeling as part of the thing then we would employ that too but technology hasn't got there yet yeah but i mean aside altogether from the technology and all of that the one of the the visual elements of your act is fluffy suits just uh, <laughs> i don't know if you're going to be wearing the fluffy suits in dublin but just explain uh, to our listeners what the fluffy suits look like and uh, why you wear fluffy suits <laughs> uh, i can't remember the real reasons why we chose to wear fluffy suits it was it was a uh, some take on sunra but i can't imagine how we actually this is the artist's song, rather, the recording yes, artist's song, right? Yeah, yeah. It wasn't it's, to soften your image or anything like that, was it? These guys wear <laughs> no, fluffy we're, suits, so they're probably like fluffy bunnies and, and very well, we, we, soft. Well, we debuted as a band, really, at, at the Royal Festival Hall, and we had uh, about 18 years of, you know, uh, trial and tribulation and extremity Before in, that. in people's minds, you know, that, that what Coyle would do. So I think we decided to, to, to possibly soften it or come across as something different to what they might expect us to be we were we were conscious that you know we did have a rather sort of severe uh, public even even uh, underground reputation as being rather sort of heavy and severe and we wanted to to do something that would just to astound, disarm it and astound and disarm people and and the comment that we got back after that show was that we looked like polar bears on ketamine <laughs> Yeah, I think fluffy, fluffy suits, definitely. And looking like polar bears would soften the image, even though, of course, polar <laughs> bears are very, very dangerous creatures. They can be, they uh, can be. At the back of it all. Okay, just to take us up to news, um, stay with us, if you would, and we'll talk to you a little bit mm -hmm. more after news. But we're going to hear, uh, this, is, this is a track called Clap. Welcome back. You're listening to Rattlebag. We're talking to John Balance and Peter Christofferson, the members of uh, COIL, who are playing in the Dublin Electronic Arts Festival, and uh, they'll be playing in City Hall in Dublin on Saturday next. Uh, this is uh, another COIL track. This one's called Moon's Milk. It's a fairly creepy piece of music, and you've got this an interest in magic, a tremendous interest in magic. It's been a guiding influence in your work. Would that be would that be fair to say? And not Paul Daniels type magic. <laughs> uh, no, magic no, with the a, magic, occult. magic with a K. Yes. Sorry, yeah, yes. the occult. Yes. Sorry, it's just yes, magic yes. is uh, too many negative uh, pejorative connotations oh, at this oh. stage. Uh, yes. <laughs> 
where does the interest come from? How does it? Um, how was it identified? Or how would you identify it in your music? Uh, it's constantly there all the time. It's uh, in us. Well, in myself, I can only speak for myself. I think people have a shamanic uh, part to their personality, or they don't. Uh, get, I mean, just get drawn to it from a young age, and I've, I've always tried to, you know, make it a path of uh, exploration and. and uh, I mean, you're a bit of a pagan, John, aren't you? Oh yes. Undoubtedly, born again pagan. Yeah. Yes. Yes. But I don't know what that means in these. You know, you you say pagan this, these days, and it means so many things to so many people. Mm. And it's it's a personal. It's, it's a bit like uh, new age. Oh, it's well, it shouldn't be. I don't I don't know. But I mean, in the, but the sense it, that it means it's, it's, it can be all things to all men or women. It, it means it means find, uh, for me it's finding a spirituality within nature, mm. and that's that's a quiet introspective path to travel. But somehow we have to reconcile that with the fact we put on public displays. And would you be interested, therefore, in the philosophy of Native Americans, for example? It's a very shamanistic kind of a philosophy in many respects. Well, uh, they they have you know a respect for nature in the way that I try to have a respect for nature, but they have a better way of practicing it because they live within it. You know, our society we, we're detached for a lot of ways. You know, I'm not particularly vegetarian. I mean, I'm not vegetarian, but I have a respect for animals beyond the respect I see a lot of other people displaying for them. And this interest in the occult has got you in trouble in the past. I mean, for example, the, the, the famous Tory MP Nicholas Fairburn described you as wreckers of civilization. What a wonderful advert that was for Robin Gristle. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, you have you've, you've had to kind of. I, I gather you've had to sort of be careful occasionally, particularly in uh, in during you know in Thatcher's Britain, lie low perhaps a little bit. Would that be true? Yes, it would. We've had to go to ground several times for no other reason than that, that we were labelled the fox, you know. And uh, uh, the, Peter, sorry, sorry. That the the uh, there's a tendency, especially in in England, uh, for the press to. You know, to seek out a, a scapegoat of the week, they have actually a scapegoat of the week club that they don't tell anybody about. And if if one gets named as that, then going to ground is a good idea. Um, Peter, sadly, we're not going to have time to talk about the fact that you have done uh, videos for Jason Donovan. I really, really love. I'm very about pleased that. to hear that. Yes, that's that's, that's <laughs> um, one of the times that uh, limited time actually works to your advantage. <laughs> Um, I think everybody has some things in their past, you know, that, that they wish would remain covered. Yeah, and and <laughs> obviously the fact that uh, you know you had to go underground to avoid uh, Thatcherite Britain is not something shameful in your past, but Jason Donovan videos are, <laughs> as far as you're well, concerned. I'm, I've now gone underground to avoid Jason Donovan, <laughs> which is fine by me. I heard him on Radio Four during the week. I think he was on with Michael Park, or was it Radio Four? I can't remember, but it was one of the BBC stations on with Michael Parkinson. So he's still around. So be careful, he's out there. <laughs> um, and just finally, tell me a little bit about your collaboration with uh, with Gavin Friday of the Virgin Prunes. Back that was back in the it was back around the time that the Virgin Prunes would have been sort of maybe running out of steam. Oh, I don't know about that. I'm not sure. I, it was so long ago. I can't remember. I think it was about twenty years uh, ago. I think that they they would have broken <laughs> up about broken up about a year later, year, year or so later. So maybe whether yeah, they were running out of steam or true. not, they yeah, they imploded. Yeah. Tell us tell us about the collaboration anyway. Well, I was a fan of the Virgin Prunes. You know, I, when uh, when I first ever heard about them, I, I got in touch through Tommy the Bottle of Milk. I don't know if that name rings any bells these days, but he was their fan club. Uh, a great name. Person. Well, he's one of the Lipton Village crowd, right, along yeah. with Bono and mm. Googie and stuff. Uh, and I was just a prune, which is bit late for that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, although they have re-released uh, their entire output on CD, so you could uh, have on mute records. Yeah, yes. you could rediscover your virgin prunery uh, <laughs> if you uh, if you wanted to. The guys, well, I became a good. Uh, sorry, sorry, I became a good friend of Gavin's, and we used to correspond all the time. So. And uh, he collaborated with you on this uh, track that we're going to going to finish up with. Thank you very yeah. much, both of you, for talking to us. And just oh, thank to, you. to yeah. remind uh, listeners that Coil Headline, the Dublin Electronic Arts Festival, they play in City Hall on Saturday night with uh, support from local act Decal. And tickets are twenty nine fifty and are available from City Discs and www.tickets.ie. John and Peter, thank you very much for talking to us. We promise not to be too scary. Good.
good, good, good. <laughs> the people of Dublin will be delighted, and particularly the burgers, city, city burgers, because you're using City Hall. Uh, this is Tenderness of Wolves. Yes. 